You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. For the community, by the community. to Cooks and Books. I'm Sarah Connor. I will be your host. Our cook this evening is Billy Grant from Grants and Gricos. Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to learn a little bit about Billy's passion and his, his restaurants, and then we'll reveal his favorite and inspiring cookbook. Okay. So thanks for coming. Thank you. So I think you all know that Billy Grant is the um, co-owner and chef of Brico and Grants in West Hartford, as well as Trotteria Brico in Glastonbury, their latest edition. Um, he has been a restaurateur from a family of restaurateurs and is going to share a little bit about his life and give us a glimpse into his favorite cookbook. Right. Thank you very much for coming out. It means a lot. I appreciate it. So Billy, why don't you tell us your history? How did you get okay. to be well, Grant. All right. Uh, well, I started out. Because <laughs> I, I know you're why they're all here, so everybody knows who you are. Okay. Well, my father used to own a fast food restaurant in East Hartford many, many years ago. He had the restaurant for 30 years in East Hartford on Silver Lane called Aug and Ray's. So, oh, right? So uh, we loved it too, the hot dogs and hamburgers. Yeah. Oh, my God. And then Augie decided to move to Florida, so my father bought the partnership out, and so he had an Augie and Ray's on Silver Lane. And then my father went and had seven other fast food restaurants through the course of uh, us kids growing up. So he worked quite hard doing that. So we grew up working in that restaurant, my father and my three brothers, Michael, Mark, and Tony and I. Right after we had closed the um, Silver Lane store, we lost my father. And so then I went to work for my Uncle Paul, who had a wonderful restaurant in East Windsor called The Eatery. I don't know if anybody remembers that. And The Eatery was a really popular restaurant back in the day, and that was... Uh, considered one of the fancier restaurants in the area. Linens and tableside cooking, um, reservations, special occasion place. So that's where I started to fall in love with cooking, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the fast food thing was all about hard work and responsibility, but I really fell in love with food working with my Uncle Paul. From the eatery, when, um, when my uncle lost it to the bank, that's when I um, uh, went to work for Rich Rosenthal at the Max Group. And at the time, I, it was um, the original Max on Main in Hartford, mm -hmm. on Main Street. And I absolutely loved it, probably in the second week, the first couple of days I went in there crying. <laughs> and I said, oh my god, what did I get myself into? Because it was such a difference from, for the first time, I wasn't working for family. Mm. It, was, it was really different yeah. for me. Not, Rich was great, by the way. It wasn't Rich <laughs> that made me cry. It was just, you know, it was really, right. really busy, and the space was really small. Mm -hmm. And so then there, that's how I kind of fine-tuned my skills a little bit. With the when cook. did you start as, when you went to Max Group, what was your, well, when were I, you just chopping vegetables or were you, well, no, I was make, a little, what were you doing? I was a little more advanced than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was at the eatery, I was there cooking seriously for probably five and a half or six years. So okay. it was at the eatery where I didn't know much, where I knew how to flip hamburgers and hot dogs, but that's where I, I kind of learned on my own. I know that sounds a little funny and I mean it in the humblest way that I kind of was self-taught because I did go to school. Um, for business, I went to Eastern Connecticut and Willimantic. Um, but I, was, I didn't go to culinary school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I really loved cooking. And, and um, I actually remember the first time the chef from the eatery, his name was Stephen Romeo, who's still dear to my heart this day, he, um, he took us on a trip to New York and we went to the Gotham Bar and Grill, which is a wildly yeah. successful mm -hmm. Alfred Portali. <coughs> and wow, when I saw that, I said, that was it. This is what I want to do. The food was yeah. beautiful. And it was, um, you know, it was delicious as well. And Alfred was very, he was the chef that made that vertical food. I don't know if people <laughs> remember that, the magazine, the vertical food and salads and the food that jumped off the plate like this. So his, he sculpture. was. Sculpture. Sculpture, right? <laughs> so he was a pioneer too, I think mm -hmm. very much. 
Um, so that's where I really fell in love with the, um, that kind of cooking or the really advanced style. I, like I said in the beginning, I didn't really know what I was doing uh, at all. And uh, Any disasters? Yes. Um, <laughs> there was Good a, one you want to share? Yeah, uh, there was two, <laughs> two actually. I'll tell you there's two disasters. Not really funny, but um, one of the worst disasters I ever had was uh, the eatery had like four or five rooms, small rooms. So during the holidays, we'd be really busy for holiday parties. And I was running when everything went in the oven. And, and everybody in, the, in those parties usually had filet mignon or salmon. It was like two choices. So if you imagine it was like a party of 30 over here, a party of 15 over here, a party of 25 over here, all going at different times. So you had to time the steaks. You couldn't just cook that one steak and say, okay, right. you know, that steak's um, done for you and like you're feeding just two people. We were feeding almost a whole restaurant like, like that. Yeah. And so one, I had grabbed the wrong tray, the tray of steaks that was for that room and it went to that room. And all of a sudden, the servers just started marching back with raw steaks. Oh, and, and, no. and this was my first season, too, because, <laughs> again, I, was, I wasn't ready for the position. You know, yeah. I was the apprentice right. sous chef. Um, so I, w I really wasn't ready for the position that I was in, but I was re working really hard, and that was one of my biggest disasters. Mm -hmm. And then on Thanksgiving, we had a disaster, too. We, at the eatery, we used to do uh, turkeys for each individual table. So if you had, were a party of four, you got the... the Tur your whole turkey, and then we packed at whatever was left over home for you. So we did like 86 turkeys in, in one day. Oh my gosh. And, and yeah. Steven Romeo was the one, the chef that inspired me most. He was a very passionate chef and, uh, and really hard worker, but he had a little battle with, um, with substance abuse. And so he's clean since, he's been clean for almost 20 years now. And uh, at that time, and remember, I didn't know a whole lot, I was still really learning. And for the two days before Thanksgiving, he went on oh what dear. I guess was called a binge and disappeared for two days. So I, I was left doing all these turkeys. 86 turkeys? 86 turkeys on oh. every <laughs> And I had asked him for one favor. I said, because I knew, I knew when, he would, when this would happen. I right. said, just take the reservation and tell me what size turkey goes with that party. So if you're a party of two, you got a certain size. If mm -hmm. you were a party of six, you got a different size turkey because they weren't all the same size on all those 86 turkeys. <laughs> so guess what, he didn't do that either. Oh no. He didn't do that either. So I get there five o'clock in the morning, Thanksgiving morning, and my grandfather's there. My grandfather would go to the restaurant, he's passed since, my mother's father. He would go to the restaurant every morning. And he, you know, walked a little walk around. I'll never forget this day. And he, he, was, and he helped me, you know, called out all the names, and he walked the table, and we had 86 turkeys laid out on the table, and we had to put them with the reservation and then into the time slot, so all the, the reservations for 11.30, and those turkeys going first, and then the 12.30s, and then the 1.30s, and the 2.30s. But that oh was, uh, yeah, I'll never, uh, I mean, it's nice that I have that memory of my grandfather and I, because, <laughs> <laughs> because it was like really, you know, it's like just a special, a special, I don't know, it sounds weird. You got through it, it, it right? Was a, yeah, it was a, Comrades in a, arms. a special memory <laughs> that I, I always shared with him, and not everybody knows that, so that was, that was fun for me. So Not fun, but that was so, something um, to remember. So, do you eat turkey anymore? <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, we do turkey now at Grant's too. So yeah, okay. we, we've we've uh, so you can flipped it. it and mastered it a little <laughs> bit different, but yeah. Good. So we do turkey at Grant's too. Good. Well, this the point of the evening, or one of the points, other than the fabulous stories, is to un to know kind of get a peek into what inspires Billy through his favorite cookbook. Yep. So, are you ready to know what his favorite cookbook is? Because that, that's why he was here, right? Yeah. Like, absolutely. You should see, the you should what, see what, what the favorite, favorite cookbook, cookbook is. is. Well, I, wait, wait, wait. I will tell you, sorry, that I have, I, don't, I wouldn't call Smack myself my a hand. collector <laughs> of cookbooks, but I absolutely love cookbooks. So, I, I don't even know how many I have. I have tons of cookbooks. And, and when we opened Trattery, I brought all my Italian cookbooks. So, okay. I only have a few Italian cookbooks at home. Well, now they know this is Italian, right? But kind they don't know good. which one. Okay. And there are a few so Italian cookbooks, I have, I'm sure. Uh, most of my Italian cookbooks are, are at Glastonbury and on the shelves. Okay. And, but this is one that is still home. It's at home in all your restaurants, too, yeah, right? It's it, it's, yeah. Yeah. This is the only, only book that I have three copies of. So. Are you ready? You're never going to know what it is in the back. We'll hold it up and we'll tell you what okay. it is. Okay. Dun <laughs> the Italian Farmer's Table. Farmer's Table. Authentic recipes and local lore from Northern Italy. This is a great Italian cookbook. And I asked Billy to bring his um, most loved version of it because I think it's so fascinating when you have a favorite cookbook at home if you're a cook, 
you can tell what the favorite cookbook yeah. is because it's splattered and the pages are wrinkled. You can tell which recipe by, by, is the by, favorite by, in the favorite cookbook from the, the way tags. it looks. <laughs> and and he came with it with all the tags. Some of this even's got guest che checks in there. Some of this is like uh, <laughs> table two oh six. They had a salmon, uh, two salmons, <laughs> order, order five. And this is a duck salad. So tell, tell them a little bit about this cookbook. Okay. It's fascinating just from the introduction, the whole concept of this Italian eating is, it, it's not lasagna, let me tell you. It's, it's right. so um, much better than that. And, and when I, after I, I knew right away when she asked me what the book would be, um, but uh, what I didn't know is that the authors are from, from Connecticut. I think Guilford. Um, from Guilford, I think. They are. The authors are um, Matthews. See, I can't read Italian. You tell me how to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> Cisabella. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think Pag Paglarino. Pelle Pe Pellegrino. Pellegrino. Melissa Pellegrino and Matthew. How do you pronounce that? I thought you were Cicilla? Italian. I'll tell you that story too. Cialaba. <laughs> So, so tell them the story of this book. Like what, okay. what is the kind of the theme and how these people approach food? Because it's fascinating. Yeah, well, I mean, two reasons why I love this book. One, because it's very um, farm-inspired, mm -hmm. very uh, local, very informative about um, where the things come from in Italy and regional. A and I, I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And I definitely think there's a huge difference between eating, especially, well, I guess both, not only restaurants, but eating at home, in Italy than there, than there is here in, in America. So this was the closest book that I had mm -hmm. um, that kind of represents that style of cooking and eating and how everything is very local and very simple. Mm -hmm. um, the point being, it, when you're in Italy, you may, you'll use that table or grating cheese for pasta only from that region that it's from. They'll use oil from Umbria, not really oil from Sicily. Mm -hmm. You know, and then in Sicily, they use, try to use the oil from from Sicily. So it's very local, the, the ingredients, mm -hmm. and I like that a lot. Unfortunately, you know, American culture is a little bit different because I think because of marketing and because mm -hmm. of not just the melting pot, I think the way, the way we eat in America is, is definitely different than, than in Europe, you know? Well, yeah, we're so used to things just being shipped to us right. from right. wherever, whenever right. we want it, really. Right. I mean, and we expect it to be there right. when we want it, <laughs> no matter where it's from. So I think that, that's a big difference between you yeah. know, the cooking in Italy and the eating in Italy versus here. Pastas in Italy are more about the actual noodle or the dumpling or the pasta itself and less about the sauce. Where you're here, mm -hmm. um, it's a lot about the sauce and about what actually else is in the pasta. We tend to mm -hmm. add more, you know, numerous ingredients to our pasta where in Italy, not so much. L very little protein served with the pastas. It's really pasta for pasta's sake, not... Right, and, and yeah. the portions are smaller. In Italy, they, they course things out a little more, so it's always a little antipasti, and then, um, and then followed by, you know, um, usually a vegetable. So sometimes of sliced prosciutto or salumi or cured meats, and then a little vegetable antipasto or bruschetta, and then a small portion of pasta, and then meat or fish. Usually. So each of those items you appreciate so you, right. for what it is versus and smooshing and it all together in a big salad right, or a big dish. And everything is smaller. Mm -hmm. The meeting... The, the eating period is definitely longer, so they don't eat as mm -hmm. quick or fast and eat in the car like we do. And They're more relaxed. Right. I yeah. remember <laughs> when I first got home, the first trip when I got home from Italy, and I went to pick up the kids. I, it was like the second or third thing I did when I got back f here, and we were eating in the car. And I was like, oh, my God, what did I <laughs> What happened? What, what happened? <laughs> what happened? I'm eating in the car already. I haven't been home 12 hours. <laughs> Something else that, that they talk about in this book is agriturismi, agri mm -hmm. which it sounds like it's basically you go and you stay it's sort of in these bed and breakfast things places, but it's on a farm. So you're staying, and mm -hmm. I don't did you have you experienced this where we you go and you stay and yeah. then you eat off the farm that you're actually staying at, right. which I think is so cool. Yeah, How local we, is that? We did one like that, and the, the best one was when we went to the winery like that. And oh. you drink it on the winery. <laughs> but uh, they have kitchens too. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that was fun. So yeah. what about this cookbook? So what recipes? You know, when I think of a chef, I don't know about you all, but I think a chef just makes these things, and they, it's in their head, and they throw a little of this, and they throw a little of that, and then they, voila, it's done. Sometimes. So the Sometimes. concept of a chef with a cookbook, to yeah. me, I was like, that's interesting. So how much do you cook with a cookbook? Is it inspiration? Is it the exact recipe? Mm -hmm. How do you use a cookbook? And th th this one, um, a little bit of both. I, I definitely do both. Mm -hmm. I think that there are chefs that um, are more whimsical and, and put things together um, 
on a whim. Not to say that that's bad. That just always, honestly, that always hasn't has really hasn't been me. Uh, could I go on a cooking show with a mystery box of ingredients? Yes, I could. I could do pretty <laughs> good. But um, we'll do that next time. But I yeah, <laughs> that's what really makes me. Wouldn't nervous. that be fun? <laughs> but, so I refer to the books a lot, mm -hmm. um, and we talk about a lot of the stuff. We're not really recreating stuff. We're just building on what has been done before, modernizing it a little bit here, testing the waters a little here. But I definitely like to stick with um, traditional food marriages and flavors and, and things like that. You know, like, like beans and rosemary and, you know, mm -hmm. beans with lamb and, the, and those fall, s fall spices with pumpkin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I do have, I have a bunch of favorites. Honestly, I, I, I would not tell you. I've used this, bit, this book quite a bit. There is... Um, a gnocchi, this, like this one right here, the gnocchi um, portofino. And this is a dish that we do every summer at Trattoria, where we make the, make the gnocchi with a little bit of mm -hmm. pesto. And this is a, that pesto is a recipe from Genoa. Mm -hmm. And it was basically, every, a lot of people know what pesto is, but garlic and, and basil and parsley and the pine nuts or, or mm -hmm. walnuts and parmigiano. But a very simple pasta dish and really mm -hmm. flavorful. Yeah. The pumpkin gnocchi I've done out of here, a couple of different uh, other pasta dishes, the steak tartare, we've, mm -hmm. we've done out of here. Oh, this one was really good too. Uh, this was a, a spinach gnocchi. This is a, a ricotta dumpling or ricotta pasta dough. Well, this one has spinach in it where it's just spinach, eggs, ricotta, a uh, very little bit of flour, and the cheese and nutmegs. And, uh, and what you do is you roll them, and they're still tacky and sticky, and you have to roll them in the flour before you poach them. So they're really light, not like the gnocchi that you may mm -hmm. have had or store-bought ones that can be heavy. Uh, um, but these are these are nice and light, so th that's another very good recipe. Let's talk about your restaurants a mm -hmm. little bit. Or I assume everybody here has been to at least one of Billy Grant's <laughs> restaurants. All three, someone, all three, yeah, many um, times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, so so <laughs> each each of our restaurants having three uh, has a little bit of a different theme. The okay. two Bricos have blended a little bit together, so Brico still has evidence of an Italian American restaurant, um, and it has some some real classics at Brico mm -hmm. that I, they would shoot me if I took off the menu, like the salmon with a, a mustard, barbecue, mustard barbecue glaze, which really isn't Italian at all. Um, <laughs> That's the American part. Right, and what <laughs> happened with that was, there's a story with that, there's like a story with everything. Good, we love stories, um, right? <laughs> what happened was that when we purchased Brico, um, my brothers had owned the bagel shop in, on Farmington Avenue. Uh, they worked really hard for like eight years and really hard, like night and day, and they were pretty successful. Mm -hmm. The bagel business was doing really well, and, th and they worked really hard. Then they opened up a bar in Hartford called The Brickyard, um, and they did really well at The Brickyard. So that's how the financing came in order to open up the Brico, uh, Brico in West Hartford. And I borrowed some money from my mom, mm -hmm. which I did pay her back. <laughs> um, Good boy. And, and we <laughs> opened Brico up for... Um, not a whole lot of money, you know, f that mm -hmm. 17 years ago. We didn't spend that much money when we opened Brico. Um, and I think that was a really, on the business end of it, I think that was a really important thing for us to be successful because we didn't really open up with any debt. And I think that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a problem with restaurants. Is it's, the, it's the staying on budget and the overbuilding. And then when you spend all that money up front or borrow it, now, now you're in mm -hmm. trouble. And if those sales aren't coming in, you know, th that's yeah. where I think, because... Even with my dad, you saw how seven of his restaurants failed. It's very difficult. Right. The ratio, I don't, know what, I don't know what the national average is, but there's definitely, more, you know, restaurants, they close quite a bit. I think it's Gordon Ramsay, Ramsay has closed more restaurants than, he's closed more restaurants than he owns right now. Hmm. And he's hugely, yeah. wildly successful and a celebrity. You know? right. So anyway, we had two, two brick ovens in Brico, and I didn't want to be a pizza restaurant. Pizza was a little bit of an afterthought for me because I was more of a chef and I didn't want to just have a pizza place. So I had um, came up with this idea about roasting the salmon. I said, what am I going to do with this other oven? I have to come up with like at least three or four entrees that I, I can't just have somebody standing there in front of the oven doing nothing. So I, <laughs> I, we did roast chicken and we did lasagna and we came up with the salmon. And, um, and I had read somewhere or something and I called a chef out of New York. Oh, the one that I first went to, that one in New York. Mm -hmm. It was called an American place. And I called him and ask him how to use the cedar plank. And he told me it was untreated cedar shim, and we get it from General Building in East Hartford still today. And really? We have a saw, and we soak him in water, and we <laughs> put the salmon on there, and, and it goes back into the really, really hot oven. And by the time the salmon's cooked, the board is smoking and almost, uh -huh. you know, starts to catch fire on the outside. It gets that wonderful flavor. And I 
telling you, I remember pulling the first one out with a big stick. You know, we have a big oh stick to gosh. go in. There. The smoke didn't the worry you? The, no, no, no. It was wonderful. <laughs> I mean, it smelled fire. the whole room up, you know? <laughs> And that was just wildly successful, so that was... So you're sticking with the salmon. So I'm sticking with the salmon. I'm sticking with the salmon. So then how did you end up... So you have Brico, that was your first. Yep. And then you launched into Grants. And then we launched into Grants. And Grants, we opened uh, right, right before 9-11. And um, that was the most stressful time in my life, We op opening Grants. We had this... Because uh, we, we were way over budget when we did Grants. And we were broke. Mm. Broke. We had spent everything. everything. And then 9-11 happened which changed, I don't know how everybody remembers that, but it definitely changed the dining, the dining scene for everyone, not just in New York, but even in Connecticut. People weren't even going out to dinner. Mm. So that was an extremely scary situation, and we were only open for a couple weeks. We, um, we rode the storm out. Mm -hmm. Well, and you can barely get we, a table now. We, um, <laughs> we made grants success successful, and now we're on to a new chapter for grants. So we're going to be giving grants a makeover. And we do a wonderful Sunday brunch there now, too. I so. have friends who just told me they went to Sunday brunch at grants yeah. and were... So it's been good. ...could not have said enough yeah. about how delicious and wonderful it was. You've brought up a couple times healthy eating. Mm -hmm. I know that that's a, a bit of a passion of yours. Yeah. And that you have been doing some, some stuff locally um, in schools as well as a charity mm -hmm. that you work for. So talk a little bit about what you've been doing in the schools, um, okay. the West Hartford schools have been uh, getting chefs into the into the kitchens to, to try and influence. Okay. So it's health. a it's a, a, a two kind of question. I'll try to cover yeah. both. I do um, share our strength is a, an organization that I'm heavily involved with, um, which is the largest organization in the country fighting child hunger, and um, that's how I got that opportunity to go to the White House. And I didn't actually meet Michelle Obama. She spoke, but the, but it wasn't much more than what we have here. It was a oh, pretty wow. intimate thing, I, you know, and maybe a few hundred more. It wasn't. It, w it wasn't that huge, yeah. but um, but that was really special, and it, and it was about about the healthy eating and, and the obesity problem in the, in our country, and, and the hunger problem. So I've been a part of Share Strength, and we do an, an event every year in the springtime called Taste of the Nation, and then um, then we took it over, and we're we're up to like ninety thousand dollars that we raised last year. So it's a, a really good thing, and the money stays in Hartford. It goes to End Hunger Connecticut, Hartford Food Share and Hartford Food System. It was important to me that the money stayed here. And, and there is a huge problem with that in our country. There's like 17 million kids in America mm -hmm. suffering from hungry. It's like one, one in six kids at a, at, a, at a playground, at an inner city playground. It's invisible hunger, you can't see, you yeah. can't see it. Um, you know, because even some of the plus size kids are, are hunger because they're not getting any of the, the right nutrition because it's so much cheaper to buy, yeah. you know, non-healthy foods. Processed, food. it's, right. right. It, it, it's a processed food. So mm -hmm. that is, is, is a big thing for me. And um, um, the school thing is something actually that I can't take a lot of the credit, are, credit on, but I do help. So mm -hmm. Hunter Mortons, mm -hmm. who's the chef at Max Downtown, another fabulous restaurant, and he's a fabulous chef. And he's working with, with the town of West Hartford, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm helping him as, long as, uh, as, as well as other chefs. So mm -hmm. he's created a couple of recipes. I think we have three or four recipes that are in the mm -hmm. school right now that we piloted and we're going to be piloting a salad bar at Morley mm -hmm. this year. I think a couple okay. of schools they're going to pilot mm -hmm. the salad bar. And so, so then we go in and we do the tastings with the school, but we're trying to do, you know, to make improvements there, but it's very difficult because of the budget, mm -hmm. um, because of the, the lunch uh, employees are, they're great, they're wonderful mm -hmm. people and they're trying hard, but um, they're set in a certain way mm -hmm. and they're not used to making things from scratch and some of the quality just needs to improve and it's very difficult to do that without the budget, with the financing. It's not yeah. enough. It's not enough. It's and, really And not some of these kids are, are struggling because during the, during the school year is, is when a lot of them get their meals. You know, maybe it's not as big of a problem in West Hartford, but it's it's a problem in, in, you know, somewhere in Kentucky and, and all over the country. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, child hunger yeah. is a problem. And even in West Hartford, there's, yeah. I believe there's 19% of the student population qualifies for free yeah. and reduced lunch, which means and that they are struggling to feed their children. And the, and the, no, hungry, the no Kid Hungry campaign, which is brought on by the governor, and I was there to help introduce that with him, and I did a couple events in D.C., and uh, that is uh, um, uh, through Share Our Strength, but that is to get the money that's available but they don't know how to use it. So they're, they're trying to figure out the best way to use these funds because some of the funding is there. It's just, it's just right. they don't really know how to do it. 
part of it is educating kids about food. Yeah. To not go, oh my God, it's broccoli, yuck, right. I'm not eating it. Which it's is green, ew. Better. So do you ever, are you involved in any of that kind of educational well, stuff? Well, what we do with the schools, yes, because when the chefs go, you're interacting, mm -hmm. and the kids respond great to, to, to us when we go. Yeah. So that has improved a lot. That's probably the best thing that's improved is, um, like you said, the knowledge about it and teaching the kids about the vegetables and, and all that stuff. That's, that's obviously step number one. Step number two is c crossing the bridge and getting rid of some of the stuff that just isn't healthy. So let's ask some, some just fun questions. Kay. Do you cook at home? Are you like a carpenter who doesn't fi <laughs> fix Frankie, the house? Does um, Dad cook at home? Um, you go out to eat? <laughs> we go to Brico and Grant's a lot. Okay. And I spend most of my time at the restaurant. So my refrigerator has like yogurt, yeah. water, eggs, and bread. I mean, I do love to cook. And I, I love to cook for my family. So I cook for all the holidays for my mother. Oh. So that's my, one of my favorite things to do. Like. What is your favorite thing to cook? Jamaican food. So I love I like to do jerk chicken and jerk Ooh, pork yeah. and yeah and curry goat and stuff. So yeah, I like that. Cool. One. Do you ever reveal your recipes? Yes, we do. You yeah. Do? What yeah. is your most frequently asked for recipe? The salmon. The, the salmon. The glaze on the salmon. Yeah. What chefs inspire you? Daniel Blue is one of my favorite. He's a, a famous chef and uh, he has uh, Danielle out of New York City. My three favorite restaurants that are in Connecticut, okay. I would say are A16, who's a restaurant in San Francisco. Uh, Barbudo is one. Uh, uh, restaurant in New York City and La Conda Verde in New York City. That chef is Andrew Carmelini, okay. is wildly popular. And I love all of those restaurants for their simplicity. So those restaurants that I love are just like this book. And that's why I love those. Okay. But in Connecticut, I like um, uh, the Oyster Club in Mystic, Dan Meisner's restaurant. I like um, the Mill at 2T, Ryan Jones and Kellyanne are uh, very good friends of mine. And um, Tyler Anderson who just opened the Millwrights in Simsbury, highly recommended. And I also like Firebox in Hartford, um, Sean Farrell. And I like them, I like those restaurants because they're smaller menus. So if I had one wish, like I said, what would you like to change about your restaurant, Billy? What would you like to change about any one of them or all three of them? I would like to shrink the menus and have them, you know, three pastas instead of eight pastas and mm -hmm. five, five, four entrees instead of nine. And, you know, just a few appetizers instead of 10 and not do, um, and just change that with the season. So all of those restaurants that I like have those smaller boutique menus, but I've been lucky, so I don't think I can mess with the formula too much because I do think that in America, you know, the larger umbrella that I could provide to serve food that people like, like Caesar salad, something that, you know, maybe is really simple, but it's really popular and, I, and recognizable is important too. If you were going to open another restaurant, if you could stand yeah. it to open another restaurant with a new theme that cannot be presently found in West Hartford. Okay, I got it. Which is a challenge. Well, maybe not. It. Maybe it's not no, a challenge. I got it. What would it be? I got it. Well, I, I, there's two. Someone what? said Jamaican. Uh, no. no. <laughs> but this concept is more like a fast paced kind of for. A, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of like a sharing concept, kind of like really good bar food, but done in, done Italian, um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of loud music and really mm -hmm. vibrant um, for the next generation. I was going to say the younger crowd. Yeah, for my well, you said <laughs> that my for my daughter who's about to turn. There we you know, go. She's <laughs> eighteen now. So. so does it does it drive a chef crazy when someone changes the way you? presented Only something on the brunch. menu? Sunday brunch? <laughs> no. Only on Sunday brunch? Only because I don't understand the Sunday brunch. I didn't know that so many people liked their eggs a different way. <laughs> I guess I didn't realize that one when I decided to do brunch. I was like, wait a second, I can't even read the ticket. How am I going to cook this? No, um, you know, of course we do what we can because that's why we're there is to, you know, we're in the hospitality business to mm -hmm. make people feel good that, that they're right. coming into our house and we're lucky that they are. Thank you, Billy, You're so welcome. much. You're this welcome. was Thank great. You. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody, for coming.